Hello and welcome to Legion Logs, episode 3. My name is Mark Sinizic, and in tonight's episode, we're going to be looking at part 2 of our Star Trek overview. We will be doing uh, first top 10 great Star Trek starships, and we will also be having a sneak peek at a new Australian film opening on July 12th. By the mid-1980s, Paramount Pictures had been enjoying strong success with their Star Trek movie series, with starring Captain Kirk and the original crew, and they wanted to bring back Star Trek to the small screen. So in 1987, Star Trek The Next Generation premiered. It ran from 1987 to 1994 and was set in the year 2364. The show follows the adventures of Captain Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the USS Enterprise. The executive producers on this series were Gene Ronberry and Rick Berman. Showrunners for The Next Generation were Maurice Hurley from 1988 to 1989, Michael Piller from 1989 to 1992, and Jerry Taylor, from 1993 to 1994. The Next Generation explored the state of the Federation, mankind's attitudes, as well as exploring the universe itself through the eyes of the crew of the Federation flagship, the USS Enterprise, NCC 1701D. By the early 1990s, The Next Generation had established itself as a, as a successful Star Trek series and Paramount wanted to launch a third Star Trek series. This series would become Star Trek Deep Space Nine. It would launch in 1993 and would continue until 1999. It was set in the year 2369 and was through the eyes of Commander Benjamin Sisko and his Starfleet and Bajoran staff. The executive producers were Rick Berman and the showrunners were Michael Piller from 1993 to 1995 and Iris Stephen Bear from 1995 to 1999. Deep Space Nine explores the nature of life on the frontier, the very edge of Federation space, with hostility and uncertainty stemming from the unexplored depths of the final frontier. This was epitomised by the explosion of outright war between the Federation and the Dominion, with the Starfleet-occupied Cardassian space station Deep Space Nine at the front lines of the conflict. By 1994, the next generation was finished, and they were transitioning to the big screen. In order to keep a second Star Trek series running, they launched in 1995 a fourth Star Trek series. This would become Star Trek Voyager. It was launched in 1995 and ran until 2001. Voyager begins in the year 2371 and is through the eyes of Captain Catherine Janeway and the crew of the Federation Starship Voyager. Rick Berman was the executive producer and the showrunners for the series were Michael Piller in 1995 to 1996 Jerry Taylor, 1995 to 98, Brandon Braga from 1998 to 2000, and Kenneth Biller from 2000 to 2001. Voyager takes a typical idealist Starfleet crew and thrusts them into isolation, completely cutting them off from the entirety of the Federa United Federation of Planets. Here we see Federation ideals put to the test and stretched to the limit as Captain Janeway must find a way to bring her crew home. With Voyager's conclusion in 2001, a fifth Star Trek series was prepared. This would be called Enterprise. Enterprise ran from 2001 to 2005 and was set before the original series, a full 100 years before Captain James T. Kirk's first mission on the Constitution-class Enterprise. This show ultimately failed. The show suffered from a lack of clarity in regards to its premise 
and a hideous choice for theme song. After Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, in 1991, the films moved to the TNG era of the 24th century. Films 7 to 10 featured Captain Jean-Luc Picard and his crew. These, fil- these films received mixed reviews by fans and critics. Some are considered great, others not so much. Star Trek Nemesis, the 10th film of the series, opened very poorly and it would be another seven years before Star Trek returned to the big screen. The 11th film to bear the name of Star Trek was produced by J.J. Abrams, who confessed to not actually liking Star Trek and turned the film into a glitzy Star Wars-inspired mess. Sadly, it made over $350 million worldwide and spawned two sequels. These films take place in an alternate reality and are a slap in the face to what makes Star Trek great. Finally, there is Star Trek Discovery, which premiered in 2017, the sixth series and the first since Enterprise ended in 2005, is set back in Star Trek's prime universe. However, its atrocious design and characterization make it an appalling series for me to try to watch. For me, I can only classify Star Trek, true Star Trek, as being the original series, the first 10 films, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. This is the Star Trek to watch and enjoy. The rest is just a waste of what they could have been. The Australian cinema is not known for homegrown big budget epic films. However, in July, we've got a great, great example of Australian genre filmmaking coming. At least, judging by the trailer, it looks fantastic. That's a new film called Occupation. And it deals with an invasion of Australia and a seeming resistance battle, homegrown resistance battle, that rises to reclaim the country. Looks like an Awesome, epic adventure. Yo, we've stopped. Why? Stretch our legs. Me back here. Careful, Bella. Mum, it's a country town. What's gonna happen? <laughs> Put your hands together for the ex-captain, Maddie Simmons. Go, ladies. Maddie! Max, what is that? we had is gone these guys are here to stay we want this back we're gonna have to do something we got people here looking to us to leave i want to know what your plan is my plan and you promise you'd help me find my family an occupying force can be brought to its knees if you have the will and the drive to fight what do you see everything don't fade australian army we're going to get you out don't fade into nothing. It's your town. Some kind of biological weapon. Hold what you've learned. Our first priority is to get our families out. Dad, we can't you leave. You need it now. What now? We fight. Or we die. Let's do this. Let's take them down! What's the plan? Save the planet. That's the plan. (laughs) 
Hope you enjoyed part two of our overview and our sneak peek at the new Australian movie Occupation. Now we've got our top 10 list of great Star Trek starships. Number 10. Vorcha class Klingon attack cruiser. These powerful Klingon starships serve as the backbone of the Klingon defense forces during the first half of the 24th century. They are the ships of choice for high officials up until the 2360s. They are heavily armed and are of a formidable design. Number 9. Romulan Bird of Prey, 23rd century. First seen by Federation's Starfleet in 2266, the Romulan's Bird of Prey is a classic saucer craft with wings. It bears a striking bird of prey image on its ventral side and is armed with a powerful plasma weapon that could annihilate the Federation's toughest metal. Number 8. Akira-class Federation Starship The Akira-class are a heavy cruiser starship designed for battle against the Borg and the Dominion. They aided in the, in the defense of Earth during the Borg incursion of 2373 Swift and elegant in their design, the Akira class is a hardy and highly manoeuvrable addition to Starfleet. Number 7. Klingon Bird of Prey The most recognisable starship in the Klingon Defence Forces is the Klingon Bird of Prey. This versatile starship comes in multiple classes that vary in size. Crews often range from 12 to 24. They appeared in the latter half of the 23rd century and continued to be a big part of the Klingon fleets until well into the 2370s. Number 6. Jem'Hadar Warship First encountered by the Federation in 2371, these powerful and highly manoeuvrable attack craft form the bulk of the Dominion fleet. From its distinctive appearance to its fearsome firepower, this is a starship designed for waging war and conquest. Number 5. USS Enterprise NCC-1701D The fifth Federation starship to bear the legendary name of Enterprise was launched in 2363. Larger than any Federation starship before her, the Enterprise-D is an exploration and scientific vessel designed and equipped for long-range deep space assignment and is armed with the most advanced shields and weapons of her time. She is more than capable of defending herself in the heat of battle. Number 4. USS Enterprise NCC-1701 Refit The original Constitution-class Federation starship called Enterprise was given a complete overhaul in 2270. It remains one of the most graceful and elegant starships ever commissioned by Starfleet Command, and under Starfleet's most famous captain, this starship helped expand and defend the Federation, as well as pushing further into the unknowns of the final frontier. Number 3. USS Defiant, NX-74205 The first ship in the Defiant class is the USS Defiant. She is a powerful, heavy-shielded vessel designed for war against the Borg and later holds her own easily against the Dominion. She is unlike almost every Federation starship before her in that she is almost exclusively devoid of any scientific or exploratory features. She is designed to fight and wage war against those who would destroy the Federation. In an extraordinary move, she is even equipped with a cloaking device, the only Federation starship to do so. Number 2. USS Voyager NCC-74656 The Intrepid-class USS Voyager is a short-range, highly sophisticated science and research vessel, not designed or equipped at all for deep space missions. It is a testament to the vessel's durability and the talent of her Starfleet-trained crew that Voyager survives and battles through one of the, one of the most horrendous missions to befall a Federation starship to travel over 70,000 light-years back to Earth after being snatched by a powerful alien from the far side of the galaxy. Number 1. USS Enterprise NCC-1701E The sixth starship to bear the name of Enterprise is launched in 2372. 
from the San Francisco Fleet Yards. She has the same mission to explore space and new civilizations as her predecessors. However, her design is far sleeker than that of any before her, and her weapons and defense systems have been substantially upgraded. Commanded by Jean-Luc Picard, this enterprise can easily hold her own against the Borg and the Dominion.